I want you to open your Bible at 2 Samuel 5 and towards the end of the chapter and uh, just hold your page there. We'll be turning to, the, to a short reading <clears throat> in a moment or two. The title for our first message of this new year comes in the form of a question. And the question is this, and I want you to answer it honestly in your heart. Are you expecting revival in 2016? Do you expect and are you expecting revival in 2016? And I can honestly say in my own heart, as I have now stepped over into my 70th year, that I do. I do. With all my heart, I do. And whether I see it or not, I don't know. Because that depends upon God. But I believe and I pray and I cry every day that God will revive us again. And I want to do all that I can do. And I want to do all, we want to do all that this church can do to heal in a needed outpouring of the Holy Ghost upon us. Now, of all the great doctrines of Scripture that, that I have preached and emphasized and stood for in the past 27 years, revival, I'm sure, has been at the top of our agenda. And may our heart's cry be for 2016, O oh God, that thou wouldst rend the heavens and that thou wouldst come down and the mountains might flow at thy presence. Ever since I got saved, I have had a heart cry for revival. Now we've come to a place in our province's churches that unless God in his sovereign will moves in and grants us a manifestation and an outpouring of his spirit, I fear for the future of our churches. Not for the existence of the church because the Lord says, I will build my church, but for the extension and the expression of the church. I fear. It's time for pastors and leaders and ministers of evangelical churches to face up to the fact. And every one of us this morning face up to the fact that there's an awesome decline in the past number of years in evangelical Christianity, and I'm speaking about our province, I'm not talking about England or Scotland or Wales. The modern evangelistic activities in the church is not working. In 2015, hundreds of missions and thousands of meetings have produced little or no fruit. Our faithful witnesses and workers are weary. They're tired. Some have packed it in. Some are backslidden. And some have become critical. Now there are people here and there being saved. And I thank God for that. And there are people here and there being restored. But the genuine, genuine ones are in a minority. There's an uns, unprecedented spiritual dearth 
in our land. And while it's good and right to evangelize, and we must, because we're called to do so, we must try and reach the lost and hand out the gospel tracts and have our open air meetings and erect our tents and our mission halls. But we must be men and women to admit that we're not doing anything to stem the flood of iniquity and the debauchery in the world. Or are we making the church more spiritual or winsome for the outsider to come in? In fact, the opposite. So there's something terribly wrong. Now I'm going to use a phrase and I'm using it reluctantly this morning, but I'm going to use it anyway. We have only one card left. And if God doesn't play it now, it's game over. Samuel Hamilton preached here one Sunday last year and he, his title was, The King Has One More Move. Well, I say the king has two more moves. Rapture and revival. And there's many, and I agree with them, that he may rapture the church in the midst of a Holy Ghost revival. But we must never lose the, lose the vision. We must never use the, uh, refuse to look at the goal. And we need never refuse to study through the Scriptures and through our nations and through our Europe and through America and through the world that God has revived in times past. And He can do the same again. And I'm going to show you from the Word of God for the next couple of weeks that revival is possible and that we have a part to play and that we have every right to expect it in 2016. So I want you to read with me 2 Samuel chapter 5 and verse 17. And I want you to look at these verses very carefully because within them there's a truth that we need to get over this morning in this first Lord's Day of the new year. Now, I know that this message and these messages will not appeal to everybody and maybe to many, but there will be one man, one woman, there will be someone that out of these will they'll raise a cry from their heart, Lord, wilt thou not revive us again? Verse 17, but when the Philistines heard that they, that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines came up to seek David. Now notice that, all the Philistines, and they were numberless. They came up to seek David. And David heard of it. And he went down to the hold. Let me, let me stop a wee minute there. He went down to the closet. He went down to the prayer house. He went down to cry to God what he would do. And then watch what God said. The Philistines also came and spread themselves in the valley of Rephim. And David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I go up to the Philistines? Shall I go up was his prayer. Now as you go out into 2016... I, I, I beseech you this morning, get into the closet, get into the prayer room, and ask the Lord what you're going to do. Ask him, will you go up, will you go out, will you go over, will you go back? For any sake, don't run into 2016 as you did 2015 and never consulted God. That's why you're in the mess you're in. You need to get down before God. Ask him, will you go there? 
Ask him, will you buy that? Ask him, will you live there? David got down before God. He says, what am I going to do? David inquired of the Lord, saying, verse 9, And shall I go up to the Philistines? Wilt thou deliver them into mine hand? And the Lord said unto David, Go up. And I love this. For I will doubtless deliver the Philistines into thine hand. Doubtless, God says. And David came to baal Persim, and David smote them there. And the Lord hath broken forth upon mine enemies before me as the breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of that place baal Persim. And there they left their images, and David and his men burnt them. Now you watch this. Same foe, same place, same time, but a different tactic, different method. And the Philistines came up yet again. And let me tell you, the devil will come again and again and again. You're not finished with him yet, you know. And the devil came up yet again and spread himself in the valley of freedom. And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up. Different this time. Same enemy, same place, same king, but a different method. There's a different method. And that's why we need to seek the Lord. We go on doing our own thing, the same thing, the same thing, the same thing, and we don't seek the Lord. Listen, we need to seek the Lord. The way that he handled the situation before is not the way he's going to handle it again. The way that he dealt with the Philistines the last time is not the way he's going to deal with them now. The way that he brought revival the last time will not be the way he'll bring it now. There's a difference here, and I'm going to show you this morning in evangelism and revival. Verse 23, And when David inquired of the Lord, he said, Thou shalt not go up, but fetch a compass behind them, and come upon them over against the mulberry trees. And let it be when thou hearest the sound of a going in the tops of the mul mulberry trees that thou shalt bestir thyself. And I'll be explaining that word in a minute. For then shall the Lord go up before thee to smite the host of the Philistines. And the Lord's going before this time. He went with them the last time. And David did so as the Lord had commanded him. And he smote the Philistines. I'll tell you, they didn't come back as quick the next time. He smote the Philistines from Geba until thou come to Gezer. And we know that God will bless this reading of his word. Now, I read this scripture this morning for two reasons. Number one, to show you briefly the difference between evangelism and revival. And secondly that there are certain signs and sounds that can be seen and heard prior to the sudden outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God. We will see this morning, and I want to impress it upon your mind this morning, we will see that there are sights and sounds, and they're in place today. And that's what gives me such hope. There are sights and sounds in place today, just as there are sights and sounds prior to His coming in the rapture, there are sights and sounds prior to His coming in revival. And we must never preach one at the expense of the other. When King David went out the first time here to drive out the Philistine, God didn't go before him. Boy, oh, he was with him, for he says, Doubtless, I will deliver them into your hand. He gave him the victory, but David and the men had to do the work. Now, this is a principle that we find through the Word of God. They had to labor, they had to fight, they had to struggle. But the second time, the same enemy, the same place, the same valley, the same men, Israel and his army, but a different method. 
Verse 23, thou shalt not go up this time, but you will come round in behind them. Wasn't it a good job he was in touch with God? Wasn't it a good go go job he was waiting on God? Wasn't it a good job he was not just doing what he had done before, what others had done before? He had to hear fresh from God. And we need to hear fresh from God as we go into 2016. And there's a lot of things of the past that have to be broken. There's a lot of repetition going on in the church. And it's adding up to nothing. Boy, we need a fresh touch. We need a fresh anointing. We need fresh guiding, fresh leading from God. And we need it soon. He says, Thou shalt not go up. You'll, you'll come in behind them and you'll wait. Wait for the sound in the mulberry trees. When you see the leaves of the mulberry trees shaking and moving, you will know I'm going to go out before you and you'll know to follow me and to mop up what's left. That's basically what happened. Man's doing his work in number one, God is doing it in number two. He himself is leading the charge, as Duncan Campbell puts it, when God takes the field. It's man that's taken the field now, you see. But a revival is when God takes the field. That's the difference. Once you hear the sound of, what, of the wind at Pentecost, the wind. Once you hear the sound of the wind in the trees, I'm going out before you. Now, it's my job this morning to bring before you what, what these mulberry trees are today. What are the sounds and the sights that we're supposed to be listening to today that I suggest to you this morning that are all around us? But he says, whenever you see these sounds and sights, there's something you have to do. You've got to bestir yourself. That's the word. When you get a, you get a, get a Hebrew concordance, and you'll find that word means to be poked with a sharp instrument. It means to be awakened. It means to be wounded. When you hear the sound of shaking in the tops of the mulberry trees, then bestir yourself. Awaken yourself, man. Things are going to happen. Oh, could I say to you this morning, it's time to bestir ourselves. It's time to awaken up. Time to shake ourselves. Bestir yourself. This sound and shaking in the mulberry trees was indicating to David that God was on the march. Because if you take time, you'll read then twice. Then, then. So it indicates that, that God was on the march. They saw it and they heard it and they knew that it was God from God because God told them. Now, this commotion was on the tops of the mulberry trees. It wasn't, it wasn't some boy shaking it now. It came from the top. It came from God. When the veil was rent in two in the temple, it was, real, it was ripped from the top to the bottom. Man had nothing to do with it. We're good at shaking the trees. There's a lot of boys all over the north of Ireland this morning that are shaking the trees and they're trying to make, to, 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 to make a revival or to get a revival. They're trying to get a name for themselves. This is not man shaking nothing. This is coming from above. This is God. This is what revival is. It's coming from above. This sound and sign stirred the people. It awakened the people to the fact that God was on the move, that victory was coming, that revival was coming, that swept the land. It swept the land, you study it, right from Geba onto Gezer. The 
Oh, may God grant us that we'll see an awakening and the moving and the changing in the atmosphere of a church. There are three things that always peak before revival comes to a land or a nation or a people. Oh, there's more, but there's three. I'm only going to deal with one of them this morning. So I'll have time. There are three things that always peak before revival comes to a land and a nation and a people. And this is abundantly clear, not only in biblical revivals, but if I can call them national, parochial, historical revivals and awakenings. And I have studied some of them, and quite a few of them. There, there, there's something, there, there are signs, there are signals, there are sounds for you and I to listen for. And I suggest to you that they're all sounding this morning. Morality, materialism, and mockery are three of the most eminent ones, most robust ones. These are the mulberry trees that are shaken all around us. You study the revivals of Hezekiah, Josiah, Jonah, Habakkuk. Study the state of Europe and the nation before the Reformation. Study the state before the revivals of Wales, Northern Ireland, and Scotland, Korea, Manchuria, any place you like. Lift out a revival and study them, and you'll discover that immorality peaked. Viciousness, vice, and violence were spread everywhere. It was at an all-time high. We must not get it into our heads this morning that things are so wicked, that they're so immoral, that they're so evil, that they're so blatantly shameful that God can't work. That's an awful misconception. And there are a lot of people going about doomed and bloomed like this. And they're saying it's all over. We're just waiting now for the Lord to come back. Nothing's going to happen. It's a lie from hell. And I'll show it to you this morning. Oh, my friend, listen. We need to, we need to get encouraged this morning. God can't work, many say. We're just waiting for wrath to come upon the world. Well, wrath is coming on the world. But I cry in the word of God, Lord, in wrath, remember mercy. And he does. He, he, will, he will remember mercy. Oh, there's no hope, the people say. There's no hope. Well, I tell you, listen, there's great hope this morning because this is an indication that God is not far away. Whenever the William Booth's daughter, the Marischal, went to France to witness to the down and outs and the drug addicts and the drunkards, she got into despair and she wrote home to her father. She says, things are dark and they're evil. And he wrote back to her. He says, get your eyes of the waves and get them onto the tide. We need to get our eyes of the waves this morning. And we need to get them into the t onto the tide. Europe was in a cesspool of iniquity when God raised up Luther, Calvin, and Swingley in the Reformation. England, England was as filthy and as moral as she ever was when he raised up Wesley and Whitfield. The United States was in a cesspool of evil when he raised up Jonathan Edwards and Finney and men like him. Ireland was the same. Scotland, Wales. 
a secular writer in the Liverpool Daily Post, shortly after the revival started in 1904 in Wales, wrote this, if I would have asked a month ago, could God revive and break out in Wales, I would have said no. Friends, with God, nothing is impossible. This is where God loves to work. Because he'll get the glory when things go so desperate and so bad and so evil and so wicked. He'll move in in his mercy. I tell you, that's a shaking in the mulberry trees. There's no doubt about it. Let's not write God off in the midst of lawlessness and wickedness and godless around us. He deals in such things. <laughs> he can handle such things. But rather let us see it as a shaking of the mulberry trees and a sound from heaven. Let the Muslims bow and scrape and raise their mosques. Let Isa murder the innocent. Let men marry men and women marry women. Let the agnostic and the humanist and the ecumenist and the atheist rise up. Let Brussels trust her wicked laws upon her land. Let them slay the babies in their thousands. But I say to you this, the prevalence of wickedness is no sign that revival is far off. It's not a sign that revival is far off. It is a sign that the revival may not be far away. Did you ever hear that before? Well, then I challenge you to study the Word of God and I challenge you to study revivals. But I've written this down. Revival comes to a desperate church, not a triumphant one. And we haven't touched on the church. We will be in other days. Right? Revival comes to a desperate church, not to a triumphant one. The psalmist says it is time for the Lord to work. Why did he say that? Well, you study when the psalmist said, it is time for the Lord to work because they've made void the law. Lord, it's time to work. My good brother David Legg texts me a New Year's greeting and he quoted Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 5. I didn't know what I was thinking about or preaching on. Behold ye among the heathen, regard and wonder marvelously, for I will work a work in your days which ye will not believe. Hallelujah. And by the days of Habakkuk was, oh, read the first few verses of it. The law had fallen on the streets. Immorality and evil was everywhere. And the old Habakkuk got into the tower and he cried, Lord, wilt thou not revive us in the midst of the years? In other words, revive us now. We need it now. <coughs> we need it now. We need a fresh breath of the Holy Ghost breathing upon us. We need the wind. And there's three times we read of the wind. Three of the times we read of the wind. And they all to do with the revival. The wind bloweth where it listeth. We know not where it comes from or where it goes. Salmon Q says you'll go to bed some night in the wickedness and the darkness of the days that has been on for years and years and you'll wake up in the morning and the whole place will be alive with God. You don't believe that, you don't. Not a bit of you. Well, here, don't be sitting watching some old soap and expecting it now. You don't believe it. But but the the 
can come. And he can come suddenly to his temple. And listen, he'll do more in five minutes than evangelism has done for 500 years. Because it'll be God working. It'll not be man have to knock doors. It'll not be man will have to plead and persuade with people to come. It'll be men and women falling down and crying unto God. The Holy Ghost has come. Men will be revealed, or sin will be revealed. You'll not sit in the meeting then when the Holy Ghost comes and fool about with the things you're fooling about with. No, you'll not pray in the prayer meeting and sit round the Lord's table then. I tell you. You'll be wounded and struck and pierced with the sword of the living God into the very center of your heart and being. You'll not be able to eat or sleep until all sins confessed and repented of and all wrongs are put right. And you go to that man and you'll go to that woman and you'll give back that money. And you'll be in such a fear of God. That's when God comes down. That's when revival comes. That's what we're waiting on. If the tide of iniquity is sweeping in, let me say this morning, so is the tide of blessing. Where sin abounds, grace much more abounds. My heart is filled. My heart is thrilled. Because all these things, all these things are going on. No, 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 no. Because I see it's when God works. The darkest always before the dawn. I can hear a rattling in the mulberry trees. I can hear it. Can you? Can you? You see, God told them, get you up behind and just wait. That's what they had to do. If you read it, you'll find, just you stay there. Don't be going out to try to do anything more yourself. You're tired, you're weary, you'll not do it. Because I'm giving you the word to wait. Wait till you hear the shake from the top of the mulberry bushes. And then you know the Lord has gone out before you. <laughs> oh, don't despair this morning. Don't hang your harp on the willow this morning like the children of Israel and say, how can we sing the Lord's song in the strange land? Boy, we can sing and we should be singing. Like the words of a famous baseball, ba- baseball player in America, it's not over till it's over. <laughs> it's not over yet. No, no, God has his card to play. Not over yet. The king's going to move some of these days. I tell you, he'll shake from one end of Ireland to the other. And it'll be glorious. It will be glorious. There's a verse in Proverbs I read yesterday morning. When the wicked arise, God has his righteous men hidden. Well, wicked has arisen. God has his men. Don't you make any mistake about it. I believe that there's men. I and young men. I'm past it now. I'm 17 July. I mightn't see it. But some of you will. It's going to come. It's going to come. God always has his men hidden. 
had Noah, he had Enoch, he had Seth, the days of unparalleled wickedness before the flood. He had Abram pleading on the mountain for Lot at Sodom. He had Jonah, disobedient as he may have been, when the Ninevites, the most wicked, the most cruel of all people on God's earth. Do you know what they did? Ice have never done what they, the Ice of boys have never done what they have done. You know what they done? You know what they used to do in hundreds? Skin the people alive. Skin them alive. Evil and wickedness. And Jonah says, I'm not going. Would you went? Oh, you're a big fella. You'll not even go next door. Skin them alive. And God had his man. He had Jeremiah, Nehemiah, Isaiah. When the Babylonians rose up on, on a dozen more, Listen to what I'm going to say to you. He had Gilbert Tenney, Gideon Housley, Willie Nicholson in Ireland when she was depraved. Leonard Ravenhill wrote to me a letter in 1981 or two. And he said in that letter, he says, Ireland needs another Billy Nicholson. Another Nicholson. Wales had this Christmas Evans hidden, Evan Roberts hidden, and a score more. Oh, my dear friend, this morning, let us not get downhearted. Let us not get defeated. Let us not be sitting just waiting on the wrath of God and the judgment of God or the rapture either. Let us, this time last year, I'd done seven or eight Sunday, maybe more. Sundays on, on, on the second coming. Well, I don't know how many I'm going to do in this, but I'm going to do them. And I'll tell you this, I have every hope that God will come again and revive. It's our only hope. It's a way past, and I thank God for Robert, and thank God for Norman Painter, and thank God for all these men that are out where I used to be out in the doors and out in the halls and out in the place. But listen, I want to say to this, it's beyond that. While we must do it and do it with all our heart and all our might, we must pray for an outpouring of the Holy Ghost, not another Pentecost, because you can never have another Pentecost. But we need another outpouring of the Holy Spirit as happened at Pentecost and it has been promised in Joel and it has not yet happened. Partly happened, but it has not yet fulfilled. And I'll be bringing out Scripture after. You can argue with them if you like. And the old hyper-Calvinists can sit back and they can criticize. There's no use in praying. And there's no use in talking about revival. It's all over. It's not over. We have a part to play. We have a bit to do. We have to get up behind and wait and watch. Let me say this in closing this morning. Every revival that ever happened has some mark of Pentecost upon it. Sometimes there's only one mark, sometimes there's two, and sometimes there's three. But every revival, that's the mother of revivals. That's when the church was born. The church was born in Holy Ghost revival. And she went on in fire for years and years and years until Constantine got in and christianized the church and Hilly got in and done his dirty work and brought the church into politics and into the world. Let me tell you this, we need God.
And we're so far away from the Spirit that was moving in Acts. And you can be prepared to put all your doctrine out to one side and examine the Scriptures. And all our preconceived ideas and notions that have been hammered into us by men who wouldn't pray and who wouldn't fast and who wouldn't wait. The men who wouldn't touch scriptures like this because there's a cost and the cost is severe, let me tell you. And some of us might have to pay it and some of us are paying it. Oh, don't get defeated. Don't get down. Don't say it's over. I don't know how long it will be. But I want to be a John the Baptist. Do you know what, what came fresh to me at John the Baptist last night? John the Baptist was sent to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Not a place prepared, a people prepared for the Lord. And I'll be very content if I do that before I leave, that I've left the people prepared for the Lord to come. Next Lord's Day morning, God willing, unless the Lord dramatically changes things, we look at some other sights and sounds of the mulberry trees that we're going to see in 2000 and see in 2016.